Hello. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Nice. A little bit of a mind blower, right? <laughs> Everybody has been be watching the next presentation. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit about um, calling for the pragmatic functionalist. So today's presentation, I'm going to go through the legal parts first. So um, the first thing that I have to say, I have to thank Facebook for allowing me to work on this project on my own spare time. Um, I have to say that this is not an internal Facebook product. The stuff that we are doing is just something that the community has joined together and they are working uh, as part of their own spare time. So there's no company sponsorship. This is not an internal incubator. This is something that we, as Kotlin developers, have been doing by ourselves. So to get this started, the biggest talking point today is that Kotlin is ready for functional programming and is ready today. You don't have to change anything. Like if you were going to switch off, if you lose your thread at some point, the main point that you, I want you to take home is that Kotlin is ready for functional programming today. We are available. We're growing. We're improving. And we want you all. So the purpose of the session today, our community goal, we want to, for people to start using Kotlin both in JavaScript, in native, in the JVM. We want to have this multi-platform development. We want people to have a single code base or a single set of abstractions that are common for mobile, that are common for backend, that are common for frontend. We want people to understand the same idioms when they are speaking across code bases, when they are speaking across domains, when they are talking to their, their backend server, their backend people, when they are talking to people that do iOS development or, or like database programming, all those kind of things. We want them to have one common language that is shared among everybody when they are talking about programming. So the objective of this talk is to give you a little bit of an overview, uh, a sneak peek into what these constructs are, how they are implemented in Kotlin, and how we are seeing ourselves in the future. So that ties to our outline. So first, we're going to go with what kind of constructs Kotlin has today available for a, for a functionalist, for somebody that wants to do functional programming. We're going to talk about what we want to bring into the ecosystem. How do we want to grow? How do we want to improve the, the tools that we have today that JetBrains is providing? And thirdly, we're going to see where we would like to be in the future. What is our vision, our midterm plan of how we would like the language to, uh, to improve and to help us build our tools? So let's start from the beginning. Where is Scotland today? The key cornerstones for a functional program right now on Kotlin are five. You have data classes and seal classes. It's a whole new concept that is available in Kotlin that we didn't have in Java before. We have the inliner. We have extension functions. And lastly, I'm not going to talk about these two, but you can look them up. You have type aliases, which is a way of renaming classes or renaming interfaces, but do nothing at compile time. It's just a text rename. And we have better resolution of generic parameters. If you were in yesterday's talk, uh, the road to Kotlin down, uh, you would see a lot of these ideas about generic parameters and how they are applied in our code bases. So let's go through the first one. Data classes, seal classes. Data class is an annotation that you can put in front of class. And basically, what you're telling is that this is just plain information. It contains the specifics of what your implementation needs to be able to utilize that data. That means that it's going to contain IDs, it's going to contain strings, it's going to contain list of users, or it may even contain functions. These data classes are closed and immutable by default. So this is telling us that we have finite behavior. We have a finite abstract uh, list of things that we want to do with these data classes. And everything else that you want to do with them has to happen externally, because the API cannot be modified, because they are closed and they are immutable. On the other side, we have SEO classes. A SEO classes is also a closed inheritance. Closed inheritance means that the compiler knows how many inheriting classes are for a single interface, or for a single SEO class, sorry. The way that you use SEO classes in your code is to indicate branching and execution. So for every SEO class that you have defined, in the future, you're going to have to write a when statement, or an, or an if statement, or a fold statement 
that is going to go through each one of the possible branches and is going to change the way the, uh, your code executed or the stuff that your code is doing based on the values of that SEO class. So you can consider them as pure behavior. And that pure behavior contains that plain data inside. It's important to know that it's checked and compiled time. That's the meaning of close inheritance, meaning that the compiler is capable of telling you if you're handling all the possible branches in your execution. So if you're having uh, five elements, you have to handle those five elements every single time. You have to add your else clauses. This is something that Java inheritance didn't have before. And it's really useful for a functional programmer. The second thing is the inliner. The inliner is your best friend and your worst enemy. Because it allows you to do several things that were not able in Java before. So the way the inliner works is that you indicate that a function can be copied at all every single call side during compilation. That means that it's going to take the content of the function, the bytecode, and it's just going to poop, embed it in the middle of another x16 function. The thing is, because it has to do this at compile time, it means that it understands what the context of that function, what it is being embedded, it is in. That means that all the generics are available. They have to be understood for us to copy the code inside. And they are all of them, they are known at compile time. If you have to have any kind of dynamic dispatch, if you have an inheritance, or if you have something of the sorts, you're not able to copy the code because the actual generic types may be different from the ones in the function. So all those values, all those places where the functions are in line, they are known at compile time. What is the advantage of this? It enables runtime generics, which is what used to be uh, what is called like refi types. What does this mean? Because we already know all the places, all the context, all the generic values, we can inline the actual classes, the actual class objects that correspond to those generics. So for every single inline function, you can just say, I have a, a function that works on a list of integers, or sorry, that works on a list of t. And then in the function where it's embedded, it's going to be working on a list of integers. And you can use that information to say, for every element on the list, I already know that it is an integer. We're going to go back to this later, because it enables some really cool stuff for us. The second thing to understand, and again, if you were in yesterday's talk about uh, the road to Kotlin down, are extension functions. So an extension function is just a little bit of syntactic sugar that the compiler does for you that enables you to get what used to be a static Java function into something that looks like an object method. How does it do that? Because your, if your static function took the first parameter, the object that is actually acting on, that means that you can change the grammar from one side to another, and they're going to work exactly the same. So if you're using an extension function, it's the same as if you were using a Java static method, where the first parameter is actually the object that you're acting on. The limitations are the same for that for those static methods. You cannot access private um, properties. You cannot access private methods. You're just able to work with them with all the public interfaces. This is really, really useful, for example, in data classes, where most of them are public. Things where uh, there's only information available. The other cool part about the extension functions is that they are also known for all the, the, the static dispatch. They are known by the compiler. That means that when it is compiler, uh, compiling, it's replacing all the generic version in the bytecode uh, for that available context. So that means that it can also extend for a specific generic parameters. So you can have an extension function that only works on a list of integers, or works on a list of strings, or it works on a list of users. If you try to do this in Java, the moment you have a static method that has a signature for a list of int and a list of user, it's going to tell you that your generics are being erased, there's a conflict in the signatures, and that is not available. Kotlin enables that. It's super cool, and it does it at compile time. So with these three constructs, and type aliases and, and better generics, we're going to discuss what stuff Kotlin is bringing today with Category. Category is a library project that we've been working in the, uh, in the Kotlin community by several people. It started like, as a small concept, and it kind of grew into something that we understood was going to be a little bit of revolutionary, game-changing set of ideas. And what we're trying to do is to bring you closer to the same abstractions and the same constructs that are available in other functional programming languages. So 
the key features that we're going to be talking about today are extension interface, lots of keywords, ad hoc polymorphism for generic type constructors, which I'm going to be breaking down in a minute. We have imperative async code, and we have a, sm a smarter boilerplate removal. So let's go through them one by one. The idea is that we're going to build, be building up from the first concept to the last one for us to understand how these new features are capable of helping us write our code and understand uh, getting better in the way we express ourselves. So let's start with an extension interface. The idea, if you understand extension functions, is that the function you can import into your, into your current uh, workspace, into your current package, into your current file, and you're capable of calling that function. What happened if we created interfaces that can be implemented by any existing type? So we can have an interface for clonable that is implemented by string. So that means that the behavior happens outside of the class. We can have a printable interface that only works or that uh, can be defined for like user classes or can be defined for observable or can be defined for everything else, which means that those extension interfaces are going to be available for any existing behavior, for any existing classes, because they don't rely on the actual origin classes extending those interfaces, which is the original Java way of adding behavior. So how do we do this? What is the coolest part about it? Is that if we have a finite set of extension interfaces in our code, we can look them up by their generic type. So let's dive into this. We're going to have a really simple interface that is called JSONable. So the interface JSONable has two methods, to JSON and from JSON. To JSON means that I'm going to pass an element of type T, and I'm going to return a string. From JSON means that I'm going I'm to pass a string, and I'm going to get an element of type T. And then we're going to define for this JSONable class a way of looking up all the instances of this JSONable with a simple function that is called JSONable code and is parameterized on T. So the same T that we are passing to JSONable is the same T we're using to look up code. This is a generic parameter. This can be resolved at compile time. So this is one implementation of JSONable. We're going to use the simplest thing that we can think about. We're just going to use JSON for this. And we're going to say JSON to string uh, element and JSON from JSON string element. If we wanted to have a, super, a different implementation that we were doing manually string implementation, we just go through each one of the fields in employee. We could just do that. If we wanted to do Jackson, we could have that. The idea is that we have these capabilities separate from the actual data classes where they're available. So, how do we use this JSONable class? We're going to create a function that is called a parser. And the parser is going to take a company. And then it's going to take the actual JSONable parser coder. So that means that I'm able to use default parameters with generic types to do the lookup for that specific instance of JSONable that corresponds to company. Ideally, what we would like is that if we're looking up an instance whose generic does not exist, the compiler will tell us, hey, you're trying to find something that hasn't been, that isn't available on your, on your uh, code base, that hasn't been imported into the current scope, please give it to us. This way, we can make sure that whenever we're trying to use any kind of JSONable, or maybe company contains list of users, or maybe list con uh, contains a list of addresses, we're going to need all the type classes defined for address, for company, for user, and everything else. So that means that the behavior is defined at a global level and is checked at compile time. We're not using runtime generics. We're using code generation. We're using everything that we want to define those extension interfaces that exist on the global namespace, and we can look up at compile time. So what do we do with this? We have the parser, the parser for the company, and then we say parser to JSON. We pass the value, a simple application, and then we can get the information. So what happens right now? Our current implementation, if we go a couple of slides back, we can say we have automatic extension lookup. The problem is we have a work in progress version right now in category. We're evolving. We're a library that is growing. 
and it's being done mostly at runtime. Right now we have a um, lookup time of 01 on a map for each one of the, of the JSONable interfaces, basically. The first time that you try to invoke it, we're just doing a simple lookup based on naming convention. So we would like to move all of this behavior to compile time. We wanted to have it checked for you. This is not a new concept. This is something that many languages already do. It's available on Swift. It's available on Rust. And of course, it's available on like Haskell and Scala and everything else. So we have done a proposal to the Keep system, the way the language evolves, to add this concept of type classes baked in into the language, where we can just say, if you've, if you've used Swift before, you can just say, we're going to have a parser for type T where T implements an extension function blah. And as long as the extension, uh, extension interface is on the space, is being imported, you can use it. And the name is the keep 87. So we want to introduce these extension interfaces on the language under the name type classes. That's the official name. If you talk to people on server, if you talk to people on other programming languages, we can say, hey, we want to introduce type, uh, type classes into the language. This is a new concept. There's lots of documentation, lots of ideas, lots of different kinds of type classes that are available that you can discuss with people from many different backgrounds. We want that compile time lookup at injection. And we're basically aiming for parity with Swift extension protocols. So it's not a far-fetched idea. This is something that already exists in pragmatic programming languages. So let's build up on this. Ad hoc polymorphism for generic type constructor. What does this even mean? It just means that we have to be able to define functions that are generic for any type constructor. What is a type constructor? Next slide. We want to use this concept to express agnosticity from the implementation. So instead of having a type constructor, you can have a generic version of it, and you can implement the specifics. And we want to be able to downcast from the generic abstract version into the implementation. Bunch of words, bunch of buzzwords. Let's just see how this looks like. So we're going to define a generic type constructor as an interface. Simple interface. It has two parameters. It has f and it has a. f is the type of the container or the type of the collection. A is the type of the content. So what we're going to do now in the next slide, I'm going to be replacing the value of f with something that is concrete, with a concrete container. We have three of them on the screen right now. We have option. If you know how option, ty option types works, basically you have a sum value and you have a non value, and it's kind of like a different way of representing nullable values. We can have lists. A list, everybody knows what it is. We have try. Try means that we can put a try catch block, and we can contain the, the function inside that try, and we can execute it, and it's going to be safe, and then we can check if the value they gave a result or not. The idea is that these three data or CO classes implement this type constructor. It's saying, we have an f, and that f is a tag type. It's a phantom type. It's something that is not, you're not going to be able to create an instance of. But at generic, at compile time, for the generics, it represents that class specifically. And a remains the type of the content. If you have an option of integer, if you have a list of string, if you have a try of user, if you have a try of result, any, all that stuff is already available for you. So the only thing that we are tagging right now is the generic of the container. So how do we use this in a function? We're going to have a function that says we're going to get the user by ID, and it's going to return that type constructor based on f. f is a generic type in here. But we already know the content, because the return type is actually going to be a user. So what goes in here? What goes in the question marks? Because if f can be anything, if f can be a list, if f can be a try, if f can be literally anything else, how do you create one instance of that? Type classes, extension interfaces. We have an extension interface that is called a factory for a type f. And it has a single function that says, for a generic type a, I'm able to create in an f of a. And we also have the lookup code. So how do we plug this in into our code? 
we're going to say get user bad ID actually depends on the type F implementing a factory. We can do the global lookup, and we can use factory.create to add that user information. We can do the lookup for user, and we can get that, that data back. So how does this look like when you're trying to use it? The problem is that the return type is actually a higher kind of an F of a user. And you want that to become your actual list of users, or your opt-in of users, or your try of users. So we need to do downcasting. To be able to do downcasting safely, that means going from a higher kind of type, from an HK of F, into the actual type, the way we had it defined it before, we can use extension functions. As we said before, extension functions are capable of understanding these generic types at compile time. So whenever you're calling them, it capable, they are capable of doing a substitution from the original type into the actual implementation functions that you're using. So you can define a function, EB, for downcasting that says we're extending the type HK of option XK of A, which is the one that was implemented by option, and we're safely downcasting to an option of A. Nobody's going to extend option. Nobody's going to extend option XK because it's, an, it's a final class. And it happens the same with try. So if we put everything together, we can call get user ID to get an option of user. We can call get user ID on the next line to get a try instead. Because both of types have a factory defined, we're capable of generifying on the container rather than on the content. How does those factories look like? We have an option factory for option XK that just says option.sum. We have a try factory for try that just says we're going to wrap any type A. And we can do a global lookup for these factories. So that means that we can write code that is generic to the container using all the stuff that we have used so far. So let's move to the next concept. And this is, oh, sorry, before that. The idea of this HK interface is not something that is exclusive to Kotlin. This can be used also by Java libraries. It can be used by Scala. We can share it across many different libraries. And each one of us are going to be able to use each other's constructs, each other containers. So we have an initiative that is called KindJ. We're talking with people from the Java community. We're talking to people from like Etalang. So they are adding these HK types for us to implement these generic functions on the container across multiple libraries. So let's put everything together into something that is useful, that feels a little bit more useful to the people using um, programming today. So Right now, we understand that coroutines, it's something that allows us to express code that is asynchronous in a way that looks synchronous. We put a block, we say async, and then we await each one of the different elements. So what if we were capable of providing a type class that defines coroutineable, that defines a way for uh, abstractions to be able to be used inside coroutines? and be awaited for. So let's take a look at regular sync code, something with observables. You have observable, get user friends, get user by ID, flat map it, list of uh, name of the user, and then for each one of the friends of that user, we're going to create a new observable, we're going to aggregate them together, and in the end, we're going to return a list of users. So basically, we're getting the list of friends for a single user. And the code looks like this, because you have to flat map, you have to merge, you have to map, and then you have to give it list. What if it looked like imperative code? So we're going to put something that is called coroutineable, that is a type class, and it contains a function called binding E. Binding E is the same as a sync. And then it receives a block function where you can await for things. So you could say, get user ID, bind. Bind is the equivalent of flat map. It means that we're going to wait until user is available, and then we're going to continue execution on the next line. So once the user is available, 
user.friends.map, and for every single user, we're going to await until we get that information. So that means that we don't have to do observable.merge friends.map into an observable. That means that we can directly map and await for each one of the iterations of the map for the profile for that user. And at the end, when everything is complete, you have to yield a result. You have to return that result from that asynchronous code, which is friend profiles. So this get user friends with coroutinable is an abstraction that can be implemented for many different types. This is not exclusive to Rx. This is not exclusive to uh, coroutines. This is not exclusive to like um, architecture components. How does it look like when you call it? Four lines, four different implementation. We have either. Either can throw an exception because we got a network error, or we can get the real list of users. Get user friends, EV, downcasting. Try. We put a try block inside, like get user ID. If the get user ID fails, it's going to return another exception. Get user friends, EV. But what I like to compose is an observable. Get user friends, EV. But I want to use IO, which is another uh, abstraction that we're providing in the library. Get user friends, EV. Everything is generic to the container, as long as the container has a coroutinable implementation. You don't have to extend the existing things to our coroutinable. You can create an object that exists in a global namespace that we can look up to have this generosity. So I lied a little bit. Coroutinable is an easy way for people to digest this concept. The whole thing is called monad error. If you look into the library, monad error is the one that contains the function binding E. It's the one that allows us to continue execution in a sequential way. How many implementations of monad error do we have? Right now, we have an implementation for RxJava. All of this works over coroutines. We provide our own implementation that is called IO. But we can have many potential integrations, like, for example, completable future. We can have the Kotlin X coroutines deferrable version, a sync task, architecture components, covenant, anything that is capable of doing sequential execution of asynchronous code can be generified using this monad error. And the good part is, because we already understand this abstraction, we can provide extra feature on top of it. We can add error handling. We can just say, whenever you have an exception within that uh, binding block, within that async block, we're going to wrap it, and we're not going to return it on your type. Every time you're trying to do uh, some kind of like recursive operation, we can assure stack safety. Oh, I want to run this small block of code actually on a background thread. We can give you an abstraction that is capable of lifting any block of code into any um, coroutine con context in this case, which is a representation of threading. And we can add cancellation because we say whenever we are waiting for a value, we can short circuit it and say throw an exception, throw a cancellation exception or an interrupted exception. And all of this can be implemented for RxJava, for coroutines, for IO, just if you implement a couple of interfaces corresponding to the type class monad error. So for things that are not representing asynchronous computation with threading, with like stack safety, with like all this complex stuff, you maybe want to try something that is optional, something that is either, but you want to compose several of them together using this same sync bind or uh, binding await kind of idea. And we have them. We have an implementation for these many data types that we have defined inside the library. We have error handling with option, with try, with validator, either. We have collections. If you have a list that can be separated into multiple lists, and then more lists, and then more lists, and in the end it has to return a single one, you have to flatten them together. You can still do it with this coroutinable style. Uh, we have other like cool functional stuff, trampoline, free, others. Um, but we'll let's go about that later. So, OK, you can say, what if I want to do my own version? It's going to be a lot of code. I don't know. It's complex. Um, what are the ideas behind it? And we've been collaborating with Eugenio, which is in the audience today, that guy. <laughs> he has a really cool library that is called Kotlin Metadata that allows you to read the information that the Kotlin compiler puts on the bytecode. 
and allows us to understand data classes, CO classes, all the inheritors, and all the information at compile time, which means we can use that to generate the code necessary for this abstraction to happen. So let's say we want to make a version of either that contains this um, evaluation, all the code necessary. We can just add the annotation higher kind. And it goes from these many lines, like one, two, three, four lines that you have to add, read and understand into something that is being given to you by the annotation processor. We have the same ideas for the rives. If you, have, if you want to implement a monad and you already have a data type like dive data or like observables that contain flat map as a function, as long as the signature matches, we're capable of creating those instances for you. We can also do instances for global lookup. So whenever you have to define an instance manually because you want to do some changes or everything else, you can define instance and we're going to be able to find it in the global namespace. And lastly, we have a really cool library that is used mostly for manipulation of immutable data and CO classes. So whenever you have to modify a value inside um, a data class and it's immutable, and then you have nested values all the way down, you have to copy for each one of the layers until you have the modification. That's a lot of boilerplate code. So understanding with the code generation and Kotlin metadata, we can give you an abstraction that reduces all that boilerplate code to a single function call saying, I have this variable of type factory or of type company, and I want to change all the addresses of all the users to be camel case. You pass a function, and function says a string dot to camel case to this composition of optics. And then you're able to update it for every single value inside. No boilerplate code at all. And all of these can be generated for you. So. What did we have to go through to make all of this available? Um, there were many challenges and many pitfalls, especially at the beginning, because we have to go through like ID resolution of generics, which JetBrains has improved massively right now. We have problems with ambiguity in the scopes with it and this. We have refi generics, which if you have used, you know they are contagious. They can only be used in a static dispatch context. And every time you use in light generics, you have to make sure that every function all the way up also uses um, refi generics. You can have unexpected behavior caused by inlining. So you have a return in the middle of a function, in the middle of a block, and all of the signing is returning from your scope because the code is actually being copied inside. We have, problem, we have tried generics and interoping with Java because we have to do the Kinder J integration with all the libraries. And we also have error recovery in core routines because we have already looked into that problem. So if you're looking into making a library and making improvements in, in this space, we're available, we're happy to talk. We want people to continue improving our ecosystem. So these are the features. Again, this is supposed to be a sneak peek. This is a taster. This is something that um, we're currently working on. You can go home, you can check it. It's been working for months, but we are, we're, we're working to improve. And where would, where would we like to be this time, next year, Kotlin Conf 2018, one Kotlin to rule them all? We'd like to reach parity. We'd like to reach a way of getting near all those really neat libraries, all those really neat abstractions of that way People in all languages are super productive, and we're still stuck with things that we wrote like five, 10 years ago. So this is what happens when you have to get your slides through Lego, and you send them a little bit too late, and you don't get approval to put the logos for all the programming languages. <laughs> so there are these many languages that, that have all these ideas. They have the type classes, they have the higher kinds, they have all this functional generic code that you can use, and they've been having these many libraries that we can take and we can have in our ecosystem and we can put on our mobile phones, we can put into our servers, we can put in the front end because they work and they work and they make your development fast and efficient and fun. We want you to bring your tools in. We want your threading abstraction, your databases, network, error handling, reactive programming, parsers, compilers, stack analysis, UI frameworks, math, data science, machine learning, video games, computer vision, serialization. Fuck, there's a lot of them. <laughs> There's a bunch of stuff that we've been missing. We've been, we've been stuck with, with some things that work, and they've been great, but they can be so much better. And we want people to come in and feel comfortable, feel at home, because they have the same stuff that they already know about. 
So going back from the beginning, it sounded a little bit scary. Let's bring it back. Let's ground it. We're growing our tools. We're doing this for ourselves. We're doing to help ourselves and help our clients. We have to spend far less time thinking about how is my threading model, how is my thing, and more about like, oh, I can plug out RX and I can plug in IO. I can plug out coroutines and I can put something else, or the other way around, like from coroutines to RX. It doesn't matter. That's not important for the users. You have to focus on giving user value. And for that, you need abstractions that make life simpler for you. We're trying to improve the ecosystem. We're trying to bring all these libraries in. This is not an exercise of like academical, you know, this is what we can do. It's not like, yeah, I looked into this thing in the sky and it was so cool. Why can I use it? Oh, because you need, you know, these uh, type classes and you need to uh, generate the code and whatever. It's like, oh, we cannot do that right now in Java. Or it's very cumbersome. Where Kotlin is here. And Kotlin allows all this stuff to happen. And it's really cool. And we want all of you to be part of it. We're not doing, developing this in isolation. People have real needs. People are solving real problems. We want you to come back to us and say, hey, these ideas, this library that I'm creating, these kind of abstractions, how we can make it better, or how can we integrate in this whole ecosystem of ideas to make our whole stack better? So if this has inspired you, or you want to know a little bit more how to use these ideas to create actual architectures to use in your code, you may have been yesterday's in Jorge's session where he spoke about architecture using this kind of um, IOMONAD, either optional, binding, all this kind of stuff, how to use it in real code solving real problems. If you're in DroidCon SF in a couple of days, Pablo Guardiola, who's sitting somewhere over there, is going to be speaking about one of the other abstractions that we are using to define better DSLs that are capable of composing sequences of code or even parallelism in code that are code free monad. Monad, monad, monad. So yeah, this is our project. It's called Category. Again, not related to Facebook, not an internal project, something that has come from the community trying to solve our own needs. We gave a talk last week, Introduction to Category. We go through all the features. This has been a little bit of peek behind the scenes for people who like to see how the sausage is made. We have Keep 87. We're trying to bring type classes into the ecosystem. If we bring type classes, we can do all these kind of cool abstractions that solve your problems for synchrony, for threading, for error handling. In a generic way, you don't need people from all the companies or all the library maintainers to write in those for you. You can go write in yourselves because the code is generic enough that it allows you to plug in anything. We are on Gitter. We are on Category in Kotlin Lang. We are Category in the Android Study Group, if you are there. And I want to thank you, all the people, all the maintainers. Um, I want Raul, I want Jorge, I want uh, Simon, I want everybody. Like, This has been an effort that has been going for months. And it's not two or three people. This has come from a community. And this is an ecosystem of libraries that we're trying to grow with your help to help all the people. So thank you very much. Um, Paco works, and that's my information, and you can find the slides afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.